I'm walking on sunshine. Whoa. And don't it feel good? Welcome back, everybody, to the Little Less Fear podcast. Today, I would love to welcome back Sarah Webb, is a resilience coach empowering LGBTQIA people revive their innate power with meditation, breath work, and body awareness. Having been engaged three times, divorced twice, and coming out of the closet at 40, she understands the pain that's possible through big life changes. She believes that a life of Thrive is possible for everyone, regardless of circumstances. Sarah teaches pocket-sized techniques her clients can use anywhere to process stress and improve daily happiness so they can bring the best version of themselves to their own lives. Welcome back, Sarah Webb, after two years. <laughs> it's good to see you again. It is so good to see you. Thank you. I can't believe it's been two years. You know, I was just like reflecting back. I had to go back on my socials. I was like, how long was it? Two years ago. Wow. And so much has changed both in your life and in my life. And it's really beautiful just to see that we can stay connected and continue to uplift ourselves and those around us. So thank you for doing what you do. Mm, same here. Thank you for doing what you do and providing this really important platform that's so helpful to so many people. Absolutely. It's it's uh, I'm following the light and I'm following my inner guide. And this is just what feels the best for me. It's what brings me joy and bliss. And so I'm interested what's been going on the last two years. What brings you on my show today? I know such a loaded question, right? Wow. What's been going on the last two years? I have been healing and showing others the path to healing. I love this. I have been blessed with a second divorce and that was very difficult. And I was in a deep state of fear and fight or flight when that all happened, feeling very unsafe and didn't really know how to process it. So I found an attachment coach that was straight. I really looked for somebody that was queer and utilized that information about attachment work or attachment styles, attachment theory, right? Anxious mm -hmm. attachment, avoidant attachment mm -hmm. and combined it with my meditation coaching and my meditative techniques that I promulgate to my clients. And I was able to heal myself rather quickly by understanding attachment and then utilizing my own techniques to get into the subconscious. Because the program that I did several years ago was, or a couple of years ago was not, um, focused on the subconscious or any of the trauma healing mm -hmm. that is available. Heartbreak is a trauma. It is a grief. It, it actually physiologically or neurologically, I should say, acts a lot like grief in the brain. The rub is that we can contact them. <laughs> we can keep on, or sometimes we've gone no contact. Sometimes we've been blocked, but in theory, you know, we could see them in the grocery store. We, we could accidentally, or we could have an email that comes across and then we, we go into this state of fight or flight. And the trauma of heartbreak is not the first trauma. It is rooted in childhood wounding and, and classical conditioning and attachment. So when we use meditative states, because we were in a meditative state when we were kids, we were in delta brain waves from zero to two and we were in theta brain waves from two to seven delta is deep sleep in the brain and theta is hypnosis or deep meditation we're very impressionable and we don't have a prefrontal cortex that's this front portion of the of the neocortex that is kind of like our brain's executive center it's like a ceo and very logical and rational that doesn't start to develop till 10. So from the ages of zero to seven, we're in this trance and we are learning how the world works. We're forming our core beliefs. Yes, we sure are. And during these times, we understand intrinsically what a relationship looks like, 
how I should behave in, in certain situations. And sometimes we get core wounds. In fact, most people have some sort of a wound oh, yeah. that sits at the bottom. And so we use gentle meditative techniques to look with compassion. The difference between the coaching that I do and therapy is we're actually focused on solutions instead of just figuring out why, instead of just telling the story, which is important. We need to tell the story, but it's also equipping my clients daily because we meet weekly, but they have a daily uh, video chat with me on an application called Marco Polo. And I love Marco Polo. Do you, are you on? This? I yeah, I'm on Marco there. Polo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it too. I love it too. Yeah. It's, and it's so great with clients because then we get that, you know, you can really get the nuances of the facial expressions and I can demonstrate things with the video. And so they have a, a 24 hour support. I mean, I'm not on there 24 hours, but they have a line to reach out because when I was in therapy years ago, I found that, you know, you'd have a great therapy session on Monday and then on Wednesday, something happens. And I would like email my therapists and they were like oh yeah we'll talk about it next week mm -hmm. but I need help now and by the time next Monday rolls around it's not the same intensity so that's why I've structured my programs that way because we we heal in relationship we're injured in relationship mm -hmm. and we heal in relationship with each other in queer community yeah so the the answer to your question is a lot has been going on yeah. <laughs> and I've shifted my meditation coaching to serve my community and it is amazing I have a Facebook group that's free it's a, a group on Facebook you can search for queer hearts break harder and wow. there's over 2,000 women well LGBTQIA people in it and it is a fantastic place to get your story out there really process a little and we have free events we have two free events a week one on tuesday mornings one on friday evenings on zoom private zoom where we can connect in community where we can tell our stories and where we can learn some of the information like what happens to our subconscious what happens during childhood um what happens as a result of childhood trauma i should say and actually connect and then learn how to how to move forward I love this. Wow, this is incredible. So over 2000 now on Facebook, huh? Yeah, I so guess you're pretty Facebook. busy. Sarah, you're, you're I am busy. busy. I am busy. <laughs> I am busy and I love it. Let's but. get back. Thank you so much for the synopsis of what's been going on the last few years. That's quite <laughs> a bit. But I mean, either way, it's all connection and it seems like it's bringing people together, which is probably close to your life purpose, correct? Yes. Yes. My dharma is to teach 28 million people to heal their trauma with meditation. I love this. Why 28? A few reasons. Okay. Number one, I was raped when I was 28 years old. Okay. I got sober on December 28th and Stonewall. Wow. Was on June 28th. So 28 so, is the number, huh? Yeah. And I guess I just went for 28 million because that seems really crazy and I love BHAGs, those those big, hairy, audacious goals. This is mine and I believe it's it's one of the reasons why I'm here. Yeah, my dharma on this earth. Well, the reason why your, your goal is so big is because your heart is so big. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, it's beautiful to have a big heart like that. Keep following I, it. I, I mean, without a doubt, you're, if your heart radiates that far, it can probably radiate farther. And the next thing you know, it'll be beyond 28 million. Thank you. So you're welcome. Thank you. Let's go back to talking about attachment and the techniques to get into subconscious. You had mentioned that prior to your current group, you weren't really going into the subconscious. And so for people listening in to a podcast like this for the first time and don't really understand what attachment is and or, or different types of attachment, how do you describe or how do you explain attachment to someone that's coming to you for the first time and trying to understand different types of attachments? So there's a couple ways to understand attachment. The first is childhood attachment to our primary caregivers. And when attachment theory was first put out, that's what it dealt with. Now, in the past few decades, 
psychologists and other psychiatrists, you know, people in the mental health space have taken childhood attachment theory and overlaid it on adult romantic relationships. So basically these bonds that we form with our primary caregivers early in life get repeated in, I call it same similar ways. Mm -hmm. It's the same similar relationship. It's just like I married my dad twice. Of course, I never married my father, but I, right, right. I married different aspects of his personality and our relationship dynamic in two different meat suits. Yeah. And so when we can look at what happened during childhood, maybe some of these core wounds, then we can understand them so that we can reprogram them because we have all this subconscious mind that's really running the show all the time instead of allowing us to it's it's just like i love the analogy of like your mind is like a ship and i the the it's a pirate ship, mm -hmm. pirate ship. <laughs> <laughs> and the captain is in charge that's your conscious mind mm -hmm. the captain is deciding where you're going and all that but if the captain gives an order and the crew wants to, uh, what is it, mutiny? They want to um, enact mutiny. <laughs> mm -hmm. The order is not going to happen, right. right? So even though the captain seems to be in charge, it's really the crew and the crew is your subconscious because they have other data and they're just trying to keep us safe. Yes. Trying to keep us safe based mm -hmm. off these core wounds. So when we can unpack, first of all, what this relationship is similar to in our past and the core wounds that it's digging up, this is the beginning of healing. And then the tail end of that is to understand our own needs so that we can communicate our own needs so that we don't resort to unhealthy coping mechanisms. Because when our needs are not getting met, that's when we come home to our partner and say, you never, or you always. Mm -hmm. And it's pointing that finger at them for something that we are needing. But if we can learn how to heal our core wounds, know our needs, then we can learn how to communicate. So we don't resort to the unhealthy. It's like, if we're needing love and connection, we might pick a fight right. instead of asking for love and connection because we will get that connection. It's not love, but it's attention. Yes. So attachment theory is something that I highly recommend people looking into. So just to be clear, I studied with, you know, coached under in a, in a private and group coaching session to heal my own attachment, overlaid it with my meditative techniques. And now I am certified in integrative attachment theory. I love this. So I've integrated that into my heartbreak coaching. I love and my this. clients come, they've been out of relationships for four years, four months, four days, doesn't matter within a matter of weeks, they feel differently. And the work isn't over. <laughs> and I, I wish I could hold programs for longer, but they're just nine weeks long to equip them with the tools so that they can then go out and utilize them. Of course, I'm available for support afterwards, but I really need to move on to the next portion of my 28 million. So, um, you know, we do have avenues for support afterwards, but the the real healing happens day in and day out on Marco Polo and, <laughs> and in these really tight knit groups of mostly lesbians, but some trans men, some trans women, <laughs> some non-binary people come through the program so um yeah it does it does have something to do with the u-haul effect yeah <laughs> I, think that, I think that the u-haul effect creates the problem because oftentimes people listening for the first time could you explain the u-haul effect? oh yes <laughs> yes absolutely thank you so there's a joke in the gay LGBTQIA community, what do gay men bring on a second date? Yeah, there is a second date. Yeah. The, right. And what do lesbians bring? They bring a U-Haul. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason for this is physiological. 
it is biological. Mm -hmm. People with more testosterone are seed spreaders. People with more estrogen are nesters. It's the difference between the hunters and the gatherers, right? And it's yes. and it's just our animal nature. And so when two estrogen prone people get together, we have that state of limerence that that lovey dovey. You know, maybe we're not totally in love, but we're obsessed with them. <laughs> we are <laughs> spending all of our time with them, and we want to move in really fast. So someone's lease is up, or someone lives across the country, and then we begin to cohabitate, leaving one person, you know, kind of homeless, couch surfing essentially. Sure. Maybe maybe one person has like given away most of their furniture. I mean, this happened with my ex-wife and I. We we blended our families, we blended our furniture, and then when it came to the extraction, it's like, well, whose is it? Because it was technically mine initially but it's ours now and well it's just yeah so the the dynamics of attachment play into these relationships and it's the reason why the u-haul gets brought back <laughs> after yeah. a few months because when we have differing attachment styles which is very common we'll attract people with differing attachment styles and when we have differing attachment styles it's like you've sat down with your partner in front of a checkerboard and you have the rules for chess and they have the rules for checkers Great. and you don't understand why you're not communicating. Mm -hmm. It's just different data. You know, what's interesting as you're saying this, I'm thinking what I'm thinking is it's, it's, it's challenging enough for, let's just say your um, stereotypical heterosexual couple to be having their uh, attachment differences, attachment styles. Um, and then you, when you come into the LGBTQIA culture and you've got the two women or the two men or, or whatever the mix brings it, yes. uh, you, you're now looking at not only hormonally the attachment style, but also you know, biologically, anthropologically, and um, it just, I feel like it could become even more difficult to see, to process the trauma of this type of breakup because it's almost like a double wham. Does that make sense? At least that's how I'm feeling it. Yes, you're on a track there because, or you're on the right track, I should say. When these things occur, these big T traumas, little T traumas too. Sometimes the memories that we get to, we get to look at it. It's like, we have this feeling of being unsafe. And I use a, a signature process called the folding within process where we fold within ourselves instead of, you know, I say, stop the downward spiral and learn to spin within so that- I love that, learn to spin within, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because that's where the magic is. That's where the answers are. And so sometimes we'll find a, a trauma, like for example, I'll just use myself so I can protect all my clients. Um, years ago, I was doing this work with a trained um, hypnotherapist and found a memory that was like something that happened on a playground when I was four or five years old. And I was able to locate it and, and able to look at it with the eyes of an adult and be like, wow, okay, I've been carrying this. So in response to your query here, the original trauma happens and it's almost like it compounds every time. That's the word compound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just gets more intense. So if we were hunter gatherers, let's go back there yeah. and we eat a red berry and it gives us major GI issues. We are gonna look out for that red berry, right? Right. <laughs> very easy to recognize a red berry. Not so easy to recognize your dad in your ex-husband's meat suit, right? But yeah. there's a vibration that's similar that we're attracted to. And so we drink from the cup, we go to the fountain, right? We we are attracted vibrationally because of our trauma. And 
the red berry information doesn't come up unless we see a red it's not like we're like oh my gosh i can't eat any more red berries like no no right. like we're not walking around worried about the red berries and that's similar to what happens here with the heartbreak this is the red berry presenting itself so that you can make a different choice I so that you can heal the red berry will keep presenting itself yes. as an alert yep yep as a you know this is dangerous and how can you respond differently it's all how about responding break... differently it's like here's your other chance here's your chance again here's your chance again break the pattern and it just gets harder and harder with more intense situations mm -hmm. the more we eat that red berry right. <laughs> And so I'm wondering if same-sex couples are triggered even more than opposite-sex couples. I don't have any data for that. Yeah. But people with more estrogen can be, <laughs> you know, more uh, sensitive. <laughs> so. Yeah. Which, which at the end will make you more resilient as well. Absolutely. That's the key. Yeah. These difficult situations are always, always opportunities for us to show up in a different way and expand. It's like, I don't know if I told you last time, but you know, life is a series of expansions and contraction. Mm -hmm. Everything is expanding and contracting our hearts, our lungs, the tides, the seasons. Yeah. And so we need to ride that. Sign. It's just like a sine wave information is carried on vibration, right? Light is information. Sound is information and everything is vibrating. So when we have these contractions, we're able to fold within and figure out where they're coming from. And when we have the expansions, we're able to memorize it and remember that it's not going to rain the whole time. The rain will pass. Because emotions are just like the weather and they're always going to be expanding and contracting. So it's about learning to ride that wave. Definitely letting go, letting in, riding the wave mm -hmm. and trusting the flow of, of, of chance. Mm. Yes, absolutely. I love this. This is great. <laughs> you know, there's something I was going to say right now. You, you, you mentioned before this, before talking about the flow and, and the expansion, um, we, you said we're attracted because of our trauma. So when we stay in these unhealthy attachments, what attracts us is our trauma. It's the, what about the trauma attracts us to stay there and keep going in this glitch? What about the trauma? We're looking to heal. Mm -hmm. But we're unaware of that. Or we become okay. aware of that. Or we're becoming aware of it. Well, I'm giving you that answer because of your level of, of awareness and consciousness, but maybe I should be a little bit more specific. So, I mean, I, I can't tell you exactly what is attracting us because it's a situational thing, sure. but it's, it's our subconscious recognizing familiar vibrations and trying to keep us safe. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, yeah, I, that's familiar for I don't know. For example, um, my mom and dad don't share a bathroom. They have their own separate bathrooms. And when I first started dating my ex-husband, he did not want to share a bathroom with me. And I was like, oh, this is familiar. This is good. Okay. I, you know, there's just little things that you pick up on. You're like, oh yeah, this feels safe. This, this feels good. Right. Yeah. And we're just, we're subconsciously picking up on these these literal vibrations. I mean, we see our, our, the cones in our eyes mm -hmm. see such a small sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm -hmm. And we're only consciously aware of about 0.04% of the information that's coming into our bodies. Right. And I think I gave you that statistic last time I was here, but I'm okay. happy to share again. So okay. there, there's 11, I'm sorry, there are billions, several billions of bits of data all around us at any time. And the human brain picks up on brain and body, I should say, picks up on around 11 million bits per second. 
So billions of bits of data, 11 million bits per second are hitting our brains and our bodies and processing. But we're conscious of about 40 to 50 of the 11 million bits per second. Not Amazing. not 40 or 50,000, 45 bits of information out of 11 million we're conscious of. So that's 0.04%. I did the math. <laughs> oh my goodness. And, and most of our thoughts are subconscious as well. Right. So that's why we're looking at it in this way so that we can figure out what are the things that I'm attracted to? We're, we're gaining the body awareness. I was literally coaching a client about an hour ago and she was talking about how, you know, she doesn't want to repeat this. And I'm like, go into the body and find the place where you abandoned yourself mm -hmm. so that next time you're on a date, you can feel because the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system work in tandem, right? One goes up, the other goes down. Being really in love is sympathetic nervous system arousal. So you really want to find somebody where it's just calm and even, not where it's so exciting and this is amazing because that yeah. pendulum will swing the other way. It sure will. <laughs> oh yeah, it definitely will. So it's just that building that circuitry, building the body awareness so that we can show up differently in our lives and recognize the pattern and break it. How can somebody recognize the trauma within their body? Well, it's a, my, my signature folding within process. It's a nine step process that will get us to the core wound. So we utilize meditative states in order to find these traumas. And we, we have something happening in our vibration here. And so we go inside the body and ask a series of questions. I, I, don't have time to explain. It would take sure. like half an hour for me to explain right. to you this nine step process. But the end of it is finding the core wound that's driving this feeling. Cause there's a literal vibration. I, I intentionally don't call it a feeling because there's a sensation and then there's a vibration, right? There's a literal physical feeling. And then there's an emotional feeling. So a sensation and a vibration, we combine that. Those are the first two steps. So I'll just give you that. Like just notice the area of the body and name the emotion. Mm -hmm. Just that is something you can do with eyes open. And then you come back and do the folding within process. Mm -hmm. And that's where we find the wound. Like, what am I making this mean about myself is basically what you're getting at. Because mm -hmm. as children, we personalize everything. Mm -hmm. We can't fathom that our mom can't spend time with us because she needs to make money to pay rent. Right. <laughs> yeah. We don't understand. We think yeah. there's something wrong with me. I'm bad. I'm misunderstood. I'm abandoned. I'm unsafe. These are some of the common core wounds that we'll get to. And then once we find the core wound, then we work to reprogram it. And that is a longer process. You know, we do that very specifically. I use an application that's not mine that um, I help clients get set up on. And I also do custom meditations, guided meditations, so that we can use this impressionable meditative state to implant the new cognitions. I love this. I love this. And for people that are not aware of a core belief, what's an example of a core belief? Well, a positive core belief would be, I am safe. I am powerful. I am um, well understood. I am trustworthy. And sometimes it's the opposite that comes up. And then we end up basically misusing our reticular activation system. The RAS is that thing that filters to, sh to decide what 45 bits of data we're going to see to decide what 45 bits of data you're going to pay attention to. And the reticular activation system is absolutely filtering for our core, wing, our core wounds and our needs. Neuroscience has proven that every single thing we do is a subconscious strategy to get our needs met, which That's is really crazy. incredible. All for survival, constantly trying to survive Everything. constantly. Yes. Whether yes, it's, it's healthy or unhealthy, it's just trying to find a way that the way that the body knows its homeostatic environment, mm -hmm. whatever that may be, whether it's high cortisol levels or low cortisol levels, yeah. whatever is that 
that organism used to being in the homeostatic environment. So it'll try to bring it back to that quote unquote stability, whatever that stability is for that organism. Exactly. You hit the nail on the head. And so in this meditation, what you're what you're doing is you're creating new neural pathways so that the brain is now following or the 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 neurons or the messengers are now going to a different road, a different highway and finding a different way in order for the body to respond differently and be less reactive and more responsive. Exactly. You got it. I love this is beautiful. And so let's go back to um back to the techniques on getting into the subconscious using gentle meditation techniques is what you mentioned earlier. What is a gentle meditation technique? Oh, <laughs> good question. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know until almost two years ago that meditation wasn't all gentle. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It was, it was over two years ago. There are meditative practices, schools of thought that are very intense. And I've participated in several of them. So have I, yes. <laughs> yeah. So we use gentle body awareness, breath work that's safe for everyone. I'm a trained breathwork facilitator, but not all breath work is safe for everyone if they have health concerns. And sometimes for some clients, we use mantra. And then guided meditation. I lead guided meditation every single meeting with my clients. I send them home with their own custom meditation. Or I was just going to ask that. I was just going to ask that. Yeah, they get custom meditation. And people can book in with me just to get a custom meditation. As I use my nice meditative voice and get them very relaxed. And then bring awareness to the body and the breath. And then slowly just implement these new cognitions and then they do that meditation in the morning or at night some clients don't love guided meditation and so we can use different states and then use mirror work like we can go to a mirror look at ourselves in the mirror talk to ourselves about it or we can just read it right before we go to bed read it as soon as we get up lots of different ways to get into the subconscious because they say in yoga and other um, modalities that where focus goes, energy flows. Mm -hmm. And that's just the reticular activation system. Yeah, That's just, I'm going to focus on this. And so that's what I'm going to see yes. in my life. I, love I know it. I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> oh, no, but I love this. I mean, this stuff is my bread and butter. So I get all hyped up on this stuff. I love I just I love when you said that when because when you said gentle meditation techniques, it kind of rung about wrote it down. And I was like, well, what I'm what I'm feeling for that, because I've I've done a lot of meditations where it just feels a little like a pushy almost. They like, mm -hmm. hang on. I'm not there yet. You know, like, hold on a minute, you know, so. And, and everybody, I mean, it's not a one size fits all. Everybody's different. I mean, some people's attention spans are shorter and some people get it right away. And some people have ADHD. I mean, it's like you're trying to kind of find a way to flow with individuals the way that it's going to um, stick in their mind, body and soul the way that it's meant to for them. And, and tailoring something like that actually brings a lot of um, self-awareness for yourself you know you have to be a little more self-aware and intuitive in that process to be able to know what's going to be best for your client so that's incredible that you're doing this Sarah I mean that's I can imagine that helping all these people is also helping you as well oh, I love what I do Lino oh my gosh I when I lead meditation it's it's a channel I'm not I'm not in charge like I, I always ask my spirit guides and, and angels and gods and goddesses. I ask them before every session, I ask them before this podcast yes. to give me the images. Cause we don't think in words, we think in images, that's the subconscious. And I ask them to give me the images that I need in my head so that the words will come out of my mouth. And it's fascinating. <laughs> 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 Things come out of my mouth. And then afterwards, you know, after the meditation or the next day or something, they'll be like, you know, that time when you said this phrase of words, and it's something I've never said before. And they're like, my mom always used to say that, or, you know, like I'm, I'm somehow channeling and, and picking up on their vibration. 
You sure are. It is meditation for me in a in a way, mm -hmm. but I still have my own my own practice. You and, are. I yeah. absolutely know what you mean because at that point, I mean, you've opened up your chakras, and so if you're in that meditative state, you've got your third eye and you've got your crown chakra and your auric chakra. You know, I actually learned that there's an eighth chakra up above our head. Our aura has a chakra, and, and so when 12. you, it's really incredible. And so when you when you're opening up like that you're in tune with other people's energy and you're at that moment feeling the oneness of the con of the one consciousness and you're able to pick up people's thoughts and also um there's the reason why you're able to see things images first before language output is because the speed of thought is as fast as the speed of light and there's nothing faster than that so you will get a response and a message through the an image before you would sound or or before we create it is created verbally so that's incredible when you're in that tune and when you're tuned in like that you're tuned in with the speed of light which is divine light which is fundamental to everybody's uh, building block um their building blocks of life really that's really yes beautiful it. very true yeah the more we meditate the more our pineal gland pituitary gland literally in the brain gets more open and active and the pineal gland has cells on it that are similar to radio transmitters. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. The pineal gland, um, for people who don't know who, what the pineal gland is, how can we describe the pineal gland? The tiny little gland in the center of your brain. So if you were to put crosshairs like at the temples and then forehead and back of the head, it's really in the center kind of like above our, our soft palate here in the back of our throat. And it's a tiny little gland that they've not really known what it's for necessarily. The pituitary gland and the pineal gland are at the HPA, the mm -hmm. hypothalamus pituitary axis. Mm -hmm. And this is a major highway that's going to change how we feel. Mm -hmm. And regular meditation, <clears throat> regular meditation has been proven to actually shrink the size of the amygdala in the brain, which is where all of our sensations come first. We experience things out in the world and everything comes to our amygdala and we make a decision. Is this safe or is this not safe? So when we have an overactive amygdala because of trauma, we will live in a state of high stress and we'll have stress, you know, we, we live in that chaos. It's like you're saying this, this homeostatic impulse to get back to that level of cortisol uh, activation or, or cortisol saturation in the blood. And so the pineal gland, then if it's, if we have a healthy pineal gland uh, and what I call healthy, you know, a lot of people are not aware that the pineal gland is really sensitive to water, which is why it's really important to have filtered water and if you don't have filtered water, it actually starts to calcify the pineal gland. And we need that pineal gland to be clean and open and airy and flowy. But what is the what does a pineal gland do? Well, I'm not a neuroscientist and I would have to look that up, honestly. <laughs> sure. From my understanding with the pineal gland, because there just seems to be a lot of um, both biological and spirituality attachment to it. Yes. So my understanding is really what brings us to our intuition. And as you were saying, there's actually little satellites in it. There's actually satellites in yeah, so... every part of our body. And there was a mm -hmm. lot of people that thought that used to think or scientists or, or um I mean, medical science used to believe that these satellites really existed only in the gut. And that's how gut microbiome gets, um, the microbiota gets disrupted. And that's why brain and gut coherence is really important. But new studies have shown that these little satellites exist within our entire body. And, wow. which, is, uh, and which is why we've got uh, acupuncturists know, know this, and they're able to tune into different parts of our body where there are these tiny little satellites to kind of to get us or to get that part a little bit more activated to receive the information that we need to to heal that's my understanding. wow yeah i didn't know that i hadn't heard that study yeah, my information about the pineal gland is enlightenment right it's it's the it's the satellite it's the way that we communicate it's a satellite. Project, project our energy across space yes. and time it's the way we yes. have conversations with people yeah yeah but i don't know physio like I think that scientists kind of didn't know what it was for for no, a long they didn't. time. Yeah, scientists. Well, they fully right. understood it. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so it it becomes lit and activated during meditation, during deep yes. meditation. It becomes yes. centered and very, very alert, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and in that alertness, when the pineal gland is fully activated, all different parts of the brain become fully active. And so does the body. It's like mm. the whole body becomes aware, awake. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's really amazing. Right. Isn't it? I it love is. it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> And so uh, I love this conversation. This is, you know, and I love that you're working with the LGBTQIA community because it's needed. It's needed and working with heartbreak is needed. And there's a lot of people that don't want to go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And in having a support group with like-minded people, that can be definitely a great place to start for people that don't feel comfortable one-on-one -on -one therapy or seeing a quote-unquote professional because this can be very encompassing, welcoming, and connecting. Yeah, I mean, I think that therapy has its place. I totally agree that especially if we haven't talked about a certain situation ever or we just haven't been very open with our feelings, it could be a safe space to begin processing. But oftentimes therapy some therapists want to keep you in that chair. And so they're not really providing solutions. You're coming back and telling the same story. That's actually what I wanted. You said right now, solutions. So you had mentioned earlier, let's see here. I wrote this down where working on solutions instead of just the story. Right. And so I love this because a lot of the times if you're just repeating the story over and over, over and over, not coming up with solutions, you're in that same cycle. Um, you're not creating a new neural pathway. You're just uh, basically reliving and reliving and reliving instead of recreating. Right. And the, the way that we go in is very different. So therapists, some therapists, not all, there are some that are great, you know, typically they want to get you back so that you, I mean, there, there's just no end. They're like, you're going to see me every week. And I'm very suspicious of any chiropractor or acupuncturist or like, let's make a plan for the healing. <laughs> let's make a plan for when I can finally stop treatment. Cause yeah, like, right, right. Basically what therapy is doing is compound it it's good to talk about it, but it's finding more problems. A lot of therapists will go back. Well, what happened during, they'll do some of the attachment digging, but they don't do the attachment healing. Yeah. And so we'll figure out, oh yeah, I'm, I married my ex-wife because he, she was similar to my dad, but okay, great story. What are you going to do with it? And that's what we work on really actionable tools, mm -hmm. simple tools, but you have to remember to do them every single day mm -hmm. so that we can feel empowered. And when that, yeah. and this, this work bleeds over into all aspects of life, we can use the communication tools, the, the healthy coping mechanisms. And of course the folding within process, I have a power technique as well. And a rainbow breath that I teach during um, various client sessions, just depending on what the client needs. If we're working Did one on one. Did you say rainbow breath? It's the rainbow breath. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love this rainbow breath. You would. It is <laughs> chakras. We're, we're going through the chakras and we're using visualization and breath to equilibrate the chakras. It's a riff off Dr. Sue Mortar's central channel breathing. I first was certified in 2021 with Dr. Sue Mortar. She wrote the energy codes and she's a meditation coach and trauma healer. And we are at liberty as certified coaches to modify her meditation. So I've taken that central channel breathing, which she's really invoking a lot of information about the chakras and the colors as well, which I, I have done, I've got some things on my YouTube channel that help people to learn. And, and you can actually see the colors as you're pulling it through, but it's not really necessary because it's grounding us in our body and it's allowing any discomfort to get reintegrated. Mm -hmm. When I first started doing the rainbow breath, well, the central channel breathing with Dr. Sue, 
I recognized that some of my chakras were actually outside of my body. Like it would come down through my head in the central and then it would jump out here and then go back in around my root. And so I had to pull them into the center so that I could literally reintegrate because when we don't feel safe or some trauma occurs, we will completely dissociate and basically live outside of our bodies in some areas. Oh yeah. So it's a really powerful tool. It's a great tool to use right before you meditate, you know, just to kind of like really get in your body and, and it connects you with mother earth as well as with your higher self. So it's this beautiful channel. I love this connection with mother earth along with yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We open the soles of our feet and we open the crown and then we breathe in from below the feet and also from above the head, just depending on where the area of discomfort is. So we couple this with the folding within process to find where the trauma exists. Absolutely love this. You know, one of my favorite classes that I love to teach is cognitive behavioral therapy, and there's different techniques, and some of them are meditative, and some of them are being in the present moment, and a lot of it has to do with core beliefs and and trying to dig that out, and um, just kind of like peeling back the onion and trying to find out where these core beliefs came from, and uh, it's just it really reminds me of this class. I love teaching uh, cognitive behavioral therapy because of all these different types of techniques, and there's a lot of behavior modification involved as well because if you're not doing the work if you're just talking and actually not doing the there's not going to be much change you actually have to physically do the word energetically and involve yourself um and actually live it and to live it to believe it because um all your thoughts are just you know beliefs you keep thinking and so if you're able to actually integrate a new action you're able to see and believe that you're able to recreate your life transform and transition into a higher version of yourself yes that's it I actually do. I do appreciate cognitive behavioral therapy and my most successful therapist was a CBT. She was CBT trained. Oh, I love CBT. Yeah. But you know, that's why I say most therapists, I don't want to say, cause there are mm. techniques that yeah, there's different improve. modalities. Definitely. Right. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. The difference is I had to go to her, not had to, I paid her for eight months and it didn't heal anything. It didn't really get to, and maybe she didn't have all the information that you're teaching your students. It sounds like you've got a lot of tools. Yeah, definitely. Well, what I'm hearing, yes, there are, there are definitely a lot of tools that I've gained from this, which is why I love teaching that class. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm, what I'm feeling here was you got what you needed from your CBT therapist, and then you were able to get those tools and then upgrade yourself by bringing mm. in the elements that you knew intuitively would help not only you but your community and that's tailor making a specific connection for somebody's mind body soul to connect with mother earth and themselves to believe in themselves and to get into the subconscious to really track down to see what's causing them to be stuck in a cycle unravel that cycle and have them have confidence within themselves to to make forth movement that's needed in order for them to improve the quality of their living conditions. Yes. So beautiful. This. this is really incredible. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah Webb, everybody on a little less fear podcast, I'd love to share a poem with you. If that's okay with you. <laughs> yes. I can't wait. All right, let's do this. This is a poem here. This is dedicated to Sarah Webb here. Let's go. I've let go of the past, the part of me that felt trapped. I had to feel into my body and feel the eternal love swimming within my spirit to release, let go, and let in. My full self needed to blossom, and now I bloom holding your hand while you make it there too. Close your eyes and surrender to the eternity of the connection of love, and you too will become it. And that's it. Wow. Thank Beautiful. you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I love it. My pleasure. So where can our viewers, our watchers, and our listeners get a hold of you if they need to get a hold of you? You can find me everywhere at Sarah Webb Says. That's S-A-R-A-W-E-B-B-S-A-Y-S. -E -B -B and you can join our free Facebook group. That's Queer Hearts Break Harder. And if you're not gay <laughs> and you just want to meditate, not just meditate, 
But if you'd like some guided meditation, I have that as well. And we serve all humans. Sir Webb serving all humans. I love this. She empowers women to maximize women, LGBTQIA, or all humans, to maximize their life of thrive with simple and effective science-backed technologies that build resilience from the inside out. I love this connection. It was beautiful hanging out with you again on my podcast. I look forward to keeping in touch with you. And thank you for motivating me. I really appreciate your energy. Thank you. You are a ray of sunshine. Hey, you know what? It takes one to know one. We're shining together. <laughs> Let's keep this light going. Let's keep this light flowing, Sarah. Ooh. I love it. <laughs> Take care now. Bye-bye.